in the previous lecture, we saw these uh, universal uh, affine vertex algebras. Uh, and in the last lecture, and these uh, Hamiltonian reduction analogs called uh, affine W algebras. It's called universal vertex algebra. Uh, and we saw that um, uh, the Zhu algebra of this vertex algebra is U of G, universal enveloping algebra of G. Um, and there's a bijection between irreducible representations. Uh, so this has quite a lot of representations, right? It's a very large category. Uh, on the other hand, when we go down to some sort of simple quotient, <clears throat> LKG, and the example I gave was L1 <clears throat> of SL2. Um, in this particular case, so they had only two irreducible positive energy modules. Okay. Uh, so a very small category of representations. Now, um, exactly what happens depends very sensitively on the level. Okay, so this was a positive integer level. More generally, something nice is going to happen uh, for admissible levels, which I introduced in the last lecture. Uh, <clears throat> so something similar happens here. So this is a universal guy. So this also has a lot of representations. Um, but if we go down to an appropriate quotient, so I'll put a lower subscript here. <clears throat> But here this is going to depend on which G and F and K we take. Right? <clears throat> um, and something that's been in the background uh, that I haven't really mentioned until now is that um, in this kind of setting, so in particular for this class of vertex algebras, um, uh, this category of representations has a lot of structure. It's a modular tensor category, in fact. Or nice enough vertex algebras, uh, let's say V, rep V is a modular tensor category. Um, so this is a theorem uh, of Huang. Uh, and something more is true. Um, so a modular tensor category, uh, I don't think anyone's really defined it exactly yet. But, um, I mean, it's close to what uh, Dimitri was talking about. Uh, kind of part of the structure is this uh, so-called S matrix, um, which is defined by looking at taking the unit object to the unit object. You have this kind of string diagram uh, way of representing morphisms. So what you do is you take two simple objects, I and J, uh, braid them, well, braid them twice, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, then join them back up again. So you need rigidity to do this um, and the braiding, obviously. Uh, and this is a constant because it's some morphism from one to one. So you call that SIJ. So this gives a so-called S matrix. And then there's this magical uh, Verlinda formula, which uh, lets you say the, the fusion uh, coefficients uh, explicitly in terms of the S matrix, saying that N I J K equals uh, X goes over irreducibles. I has this go, this is I X J X K X dual zero H, something like that. Okay. Uh, right. The cool thing is uh, in this vertex algebra context, uh, so another big thing about vertex algebras I haven't mentioned yet, uh, is that again, for nice vertex algebras, if you look at the graded dimensions of the irreducible modules, uh, if you interpret these correctly, they become modular forms, or rather modular functions. And the modular transformations of these uh, modular functions reproduce this S matrix, okay? Uh, also, in Q to the N, uh, you know, with some normalizing factor, Q to the something. Um, one over tau. Okay, and yeah, the point is, if you can compute this matrix, so if you if you can compute the characters explicitly enough to get this S matrix, 
then the theorem says that it's equal to this S matrix. And then you can compute the fusion rules. Here are M as a module or was the Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, and, uh, so when I write chi i, I mean, um, so nice enough here means there's finite number of irreducible modules, is uh, complete reducibility and a bunch of other finiteness conditions. So I'll, I'll label the modules M1 through to Mk, say, um, and then chi i means character of the ith irreducible module. I think I recall that the S matrices were very slightly different. Oh, uh, it's like a different normalization. Ah, uh, perhaps. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they're normalized by yeah. I'm being pretty vague. Comma J. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is normalized by dimensional yeah. 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 Probably the dimension of the module. Yeah. Related in a in a very comprehensible way, which I can't remember. All right. Um, <laughs> Continuing with uh, sort of what I was talking about before, so so remember this notion of admissible level. Um, before, uh, no, so some notation. So note by PR. Okay. Bit of admissible makes a little k. Uh, I probably should use something like ADM instead of PR. So PR comes from principal, just to the fact there are principal and co-principal weights, but everything I'm going to say is, applies to co-principal as well with the appropriate modifications. But this is what we write in the paper, so I'm just going to uh, use that notation. So the the statement is um, uh, the Jou algebra. Of L K G, which I remember is uh, U divided by some ideal, um, where uh, the, the the problem is it's difficult to identify this ideal. Uh, so this is just by definition the image in the Jou algebra of the um, maximal proper submodule of uh, V K G. So it turns out this is isomorphic to a direct sum over uh, lambda in yeah k. I'll put brackets here. Uh, of u divided by. Oh man, I haven't introduced any of the notation I need yet. Um, all right, where is modulo dot action w? Uh, so here j lambda. So these are these um, so-called annihilating ideals. So something that people do. The theory of primitive ideals in enveloping algebras is uh, take a, a irreducible highest weight module and consider its annihilator uh, in U, right? Um, um, and there's a classical theorem that so there's a notion of uh, so called primitive ideals, and it turns out every primitive ideal is of this form it's the annihilator of some highest weight module. Um, is this lambda and weight lambda or finite weight lambda? Yeah, I'm um, kind of depending on context, it either means a finite weight or the level k lambda zero plus a finite weight. Yeah, so in the annihilator, it's finite, but in the lower yeah. effect, it's that one. Ah, no, here it's finite as well. Also finite. Yeah. Uh, so maybe I'll. Yeah. Uh, finite vowel group. Yeah. Okay, so quick sketch of the approach. Uh, so if the center, central character, uh, it's just a homomorphism, let's just see. Uh, so in particular, if we have a weight lambda, um, so for lambda and H, instead of the highest weight vector inside L of lambda or M of lambda. Uh, and then by evaluation on that vector, you get a central character, right? So Z V lambda 
equals gamma lambda of ZB lambda equals Z in the center defines character equal gamma lambda. Um, and very roughly the idea uh, is to consider Zhu algebra. So this is a module over the center and we'll tensor it with uh, gamma lambda. Well, for any lambda, this is going to be U divided by some ideal. The point is this ideal J is going to define some submodule in M of lambda. So we'll have that uh, of lambda over J M of lambda, the Zhu module. Uh, but we already know that the only highest weight modules for the Zhu algebra uh, from Arakawa's theorem are the L lambda for lambda, the principal admissible weights, right? So this must actually be L of lambda or zero if uh, lambda is not admissible. And if it is admissible, then we know that this J must in fact coincide with the annihilating ideal of the irreducible, so it's J lambda. To reach the conclusion, there's a few more things you need to do because uh, in principle, what could happen is, so when, when you um, intersect with the, well, with the center, um, you might get kind of fat points in a sense, like, uh, algebras of the form polynomials modulo X squared, for example. Um, and you need to rule out that such things can occur, um, but you use the, uh, so if such a thing occurred, you could use it, you could induce and then produce a self extension of um, uh, modules for the vertex algebra. And there's some theorem of uh, Katz and Gorelick about self extensions uh, between modules of affine the algebras that rules out that case. So there, there's quite a few details, but I hope that kind of gives the idea. Yeah. <laughs> Can you say why what I saw over, like why we have this question about the Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. So, um, right. So the the J lambdas for distinct, uh, yeah. If two weights are related by the the dot action, then they have the same uh, annihilating ideal. Yeah. So, so the so J, J lambda is a maximal ideal of, or not, not not maximal. So the, the decomposition is a, a semi simple decomposition. Am I right? Yeah, the infinite dimensional algebras in general. Uh, no, not simple algebra. And, uh, they're, they're simple, but um, simple but infinite dimensional. And how, how many lambdas? Is, is it finite or infinitely many lambdas in? Oh, the sum is finite. Sum is finite. Yeah. And each component is infinite dimensional. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And the, the, something that confused me a bit is that although they're simple algebras, they can have multiple non-isomorphic simple modules, for example. So it's quite different than simple, uh, quite different than the finite dimensional case. Yeah. If it's integral, then then they're finite dimensional. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think I think it makes sense if everywhere you just think of lambda as a um, finite weight. Yeah, but implicit. I, I, many times I'll just I'll switch between lambda the finite weight and lambda plus k lambda zero. Now that W B this uh, BRST reduction. of LKG, okay, so some quotient of, okay, so this was the reduction of the universal guy, now we're taking the reduction of a simple quotient, and the Joule algebra of W is some, oh, something that I'm not really going to explain, but I hope is plausible, um, is that so since this um, Hamiltonian reduction was uh, motivated by this uh, Kostin-Sternberg picture, right? It's just a vertex algebra 
version of what they did for associative algebras, um, you can kind of believe that uh, the passage to there's some compatibility between the passage from vertex algebras to Joux algebras and intertwining these two um, cohomology functors. Indeed, it's a theorem of uh, Tomiyuki that these these processes commute somehow, right? So intertwines in zero f the vertex algebra level and zero f plus the associated algebra version. Okay, so we know that so we have some characterization of the Joux algebra. Uh, w algebra. And let me note this um, this could very easily be zero, right? Um, and well, yeah, so say, yeah, let's consider the case of an integer. Um, so k is integral. If f is zero, then the Hamiltonian reduction does nothing. They're just uh, so the w algebra is just the affine the algebra. And then the w algebra is LKG itself. Uh, but if f is non zero, um, then, well, then W equals zero. Um, we sort of saw this uh, at the level of characters in the last lecture. Um, so I took vertex algebra uh, like that with uh, finite dimensional graded pieces, right? And then tensored with uh, this F charge guy. And this has a vacuum vector. And these guys here, which correspond to elements in this algebra N, right? Which in the present case is equal to a positive part of G uh, with respect to this grading and just by the little potent element. And it kind of went like that. I mean, attempt to the two together and take the, the super character because you have this uh, cancellation between these parts, the, the character equals zero. Okay, so that's not a proof, but um, that's an indication of a, of a fact, which is that uh, when you do this reduction on modules, which are in some sense too small, then you tend to get zero. Okay, so then how to fix that? So what one would like to do is find modules on this side, which are in a sense big enough so that when you do the reduction, uh, <clears throat> you get something non-zero and hopefully not too big. Okay, so a bit more concretely. Oh yeah, okay. <clears throat> so recall, so this ideal I, K and U, um, so something that's frequently done uh, in this theory is to look at associated gradients and try to think geometrically uh, about these, these objects. So uh, filtration on U and then associated graded of U is the symmetric algebra on G, which is functions on this affine variety, G star. Um, then define the so-called associated variety of IK, which is the spectrum, the graded of IK, which is now inside G star, okay? Um, <coughs> to choose F. What we need to do is to set things up in such a way that uh, we choose our nilpotent element inside so-called open part of this variety. So indeed, theorem of Tomiyuki, that the associated variety of OK, of IK, is um, the closure of a certain nilpotent orbit. Um, and it turns out this nilpotent orbit depends only on the denominator, only on denominator of uh, this level yeah yeah is there enough here to require a facility in any way or is it a general statement uh well to it, it uses the 
yeah. uh, characterization of the Zhu algebra here that I'm just erasing. So it, I would say. But the commutative is still important. Yeah. 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 So we'll do this. Um, so our level has determined for us um, a particular class of nilpotent elements that we'd like to, uh, that are going to be particularly good for doing Hamiltonian reduction. Indeed, because there's a theorem of Losev, which says that uh, Hamiltonian reduction. So this is uh, now in the classical picture of finite W algebras. Uh, when you take Hamiltonian reduction of quotients of this form, then you get zero if the variety of J lambda is a proper subset of the closure of the orbit. And at some finite dimensional associative algebra, if you have equality, okay? So you could ask, well, what happens if uh, the variety of J lambda is larger than this? But so we've just chosen things so that for all of the admissible weights at our level, we're going to have this inclusion. Okay. And of course, for us, J lambda is inside IK. So if our J lambda is going to be a subset of IK, which by choice of is this guy okay? So um, our Zhu algebra is going to be finite dimensional. As I say, if we right, if if we'd have gone to kind of two smaller denominator, uh, it would be zero. But uh, so I'm going to use some terminology, which I, I'm only going to use during these lectures. Uh, uh, couldn't really. I keep referring to this notion by a formula, um, I figured I needed a word for it, but I couldn't really think of any very decent words. I'm gonna call such a weight replete if we have this equality, okay? Because it's somehow, you know, for any admissible weight, we have an inclusion here. And so we want to think of uh, lambda for which it's a proper inclusion as being kind of too small, but any weight for which it's kind of just the right size, I'll call it replete. I invite people to suggest better names. Uh, two, we'll call, so now we have uh, spec two. Um, I think it means kind of full or um, like, yeah. But yeah, sorry. It's very complex. <laughs> uh, there's a clarification about the definition of var i k. Oh yeah. Is it spec of the graded ideal or the quotient of graded of u? Oh uh oh yeah you're right yeah yeah it should be the not quotient. me somebody some clever person in the chat. Yeah I, yeah I guess yeah thanks to that person in the chat. Yeah. And can one say in some sense what this on the level root system, what this map is that assigns to numbers to denominators, field for and order? Well, that must be something curious, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. Um, uh, uh, so Tom Yuki would be the one to explain. Um, I mean, all I can say is um, that it's kind of explicitly, ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so so if Q, and associated to Q, you consider X and G uh, such that the adjoint of X um, to power, not quite Q, but rather 2Q equals zero. So of all the nilpotent elements, the nilpotent elements that are nilpotent of that degree is some subset. Um, so it's a, this defines a subset of the nilpotent cone. Uh, which turns out to be the closure of a single orbit, which you then call OQ. Okay, right. that's a nilpotent orbit by itself. And so, for example, so not all nilpotent elements arise this way. So, for example, if you're working in SLN, uh, where nilpotent orbits are well known to be parameterized by partitions of N, um, 
the OQ corresponds to kind of doing Euclidean division of n by q. So here, if q were four and n is 10, then you kind of put as many blocks of q as you can and then just whatever's left over. Um, okay. Or maybe, uh, yeah, I, so I wrote spec here. I put, I, all I meant was just the, the, um, the zero set of this ideal, I guess. So, yeah. <clears throat> Then I'm confused when I way over there you have a smaller ideal, so the variety is, should be bigger. Is that how you're Oh, yeah, sorry, this is the wrong way around. Thanks. But yeah, so that, yeah, that does imply that. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, okay, so. Because of some technical results, it's important to um, kind of be able to refer everything in some sense to, to weights of the following form. These are ones that, so we have this decomposition of G. Um, it has this zero part, G zero. And we'd like our weights to be integrable with respect to G zero. Um, but on the other hand, we want them to be kind of as big as possible so that the Hamiltonian reduction doesn't kill the corresponding module. So uh, is anti-dominant with respect to all G alpha. Uh, uh, G alpha and G greater than zero. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, now I also need a name for weight satisfying this long complicated condition. So I don't know, these are kind of just right in some sense, right? They're integrable with respect to a particular part and they're completely non-integrable with respect to the rest. So forgive me for this. Uh, Golden Ox weights. Yes. Yeah, once again, I do apologize. Um, uh, okay, so yeah, so why, yeah, why do we want Goldilocks weights um, because Huh? No. <laughs> okay, so you kind of need this uh, condition. So the, the, the whole part of the story that I haven't really told, um, which is that. So I've been talking about this uh, BRST cohomology, taking the the affine the universal affine vertex algebra. You apply this cohomology, and you get this W algebra. And the implication is that you can do the same thing for modules over the vertex algebra of the affine vertex algebra, do reduction and get modules for the W algebra. Um, now, and then you would like that functor to be, for example, exact, um, to vanish in degree outside of zero, well, which implies exactness. Um, since vermis to vermis, and then using exactness, do arguments so that you can show that sends irreducibles to reducibles, all these kinds of things. Unfortunately, the Hamiltonian reduction in the form I described, it doesn't, there's some technical difficulties in trying to prove these facts. So there's a modification um, called the minus reduction for which Tomiyuki proved uh, exactness and all these things I'm talking about. Um, so for that to work also, this technical condition about integrality with respect to G zero uh, enters. So this is why yeah, you want to be able to work with uh, weights of that form, okay? Anyway, um, right, so this gives a source of uh, irreducible modules for the W algebra. Ah, uh, yeah, this is the, so, so this is a module for the, the Zhu algebra, and this just means the corresponding irreducible positive energy module for the affine W algebra. Yeah, yeah. Just your module, uh, which actually, when I was talking about this the other day, I very briefly described that you can induce, we'll call that M, and then this is the kind of irreducible quotient. So let's assume that um, every replete weight has a representative, which is Goldilocks. And then if that's the case, then we're good. Um, in the sense that, 
irreducible module over W gives rise to an irreducible module over uh, the corresponding Zhu algebra, which we know is given as a product of those algebras. We know there's a finite number of them. We know that each of them has a unique irreducible module. And we know that it's obtained by Hamiltonian reduction of something uh, coming from the affine level. And then since you have a reasonable amount of control over um, extensions between modules for the uh, affine Lie algebra, you can prove that there are no extensions between corresponding irreducible modules for the W algebra, since you have a rational vertex algebra. <coughs> Okay. Actually, just about on time today. Um, all right, any questions? So that was a lot of hypotheses on top of hypotheses. So, so now I wanna give some examples. So in particular, this thing should have um, uh, a tensor structure, braided tensor structure, modular tensor category with an S matrix, which can be computed if we can figure out the characters of these uh, modules. Yeah, maybe I should I should comment um, just in passing that, that in this theorem. Oh yeah, I mean, so I credit it to Tommy. Okay, it's partly me as well. Um, but um, uh, a key part is um, there's a so-called component group that Justine talked about last week. Um, so part of the yeah. So another reason for considering this Goldilocks condition is that. Um, uh, yeah, in general, this, this component group appears and um, uh, each of these modules for these algebras can have several different modules, um, which uh, have a transitive action of this component group. Um, and part of this uh, importance of this integrality condition is that it, you can use it to show that the action of this uh, component group is trivial. So if you know that it's trivial and it acts transitively, then you know there's only one module in each class. Um, so it, it seems like a, it's a pretty difficult problem to go beyond that case. But yeah, I just wanted to comment that Justina's sort of taking the first steps into, into that territory. Um, it's actually non-trivial actions of this component group. Yeah. Yep. So you coupled this section exceptional. Uh, yep. Um, something or others. Is, uh, is, is this assumption here? to the definition of exceptionality? No, um, it's... Well, it's ex always is true. Uh, exceptional, I mean, there, there's a couple of, a couple of variants on what you could call exceptional. I would say exceptional is uh, where you take a level and F satisfying that condition up there. Um, unfortunately, yeah, not every, not every exceptional W algebra satisfies this stronger condition. Um, so, so in type A, I guess in type A, we get everything, right? Yeah. Um, and it's just slightly less clear in other cases. Um, in in non-simply laced cases, uh, it's definitely not true. Um, uh, just because, yeah, somehow the vowel group can't send a short root to a long root, so uh, yeah. But in the simply laced cases, we get a pretty big fraction of uh, exceptional W algebras. So generalizing the, the Val character formula, the lambda admissible, uh, there's a formula for the character, corresponding irreducible module, which is given by sum over the Val group. Okay, so I haven't defined this yet, but um, remember that admissible is defined by saying you take this integral root subsystem uh, corresponding to lambda, uh, and then in that root system, so you, you then demand that uh, lambda be in a sense dominant integral with respect to the that root subsystem. You also have a system of simple roots um, inside there, and then you take the subgroup of the vial group generated by uh, uh, those simple reflections. And here I really mean the affine vial group. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah, and um, the character is just given by this uh, alternating sum of, uh, of uh, characters of uh, corresponding vermas, where this dot action appears. 
Um, in particular, if you factor out the, the vial denominator, which I'll call R, then there's just some term, which I'll call B lambda divided by R. Um, and although the, the exact form of R doesn't really matter, uh, since I'll use it a few times, it makes sense for me to, to write it out. Denominator R is the product of uh, the positive, yeah. Yeah, well, um, well, I apologize, I'm going so fast. Um, so uh, these, these begin life as formal characters. So there, there's some, you know, infinite sums um, where the terms are exponentials of weights in the affine Lie algebra. Um, so remember one of those weights was delta. Um, so I'll give a name to that. Uh, e to the minus delta is Q. And then Q in the, as I was describing it before, uh, becomes a modular parameter if I write it as e to the two pi i tau. So that's the sense in which these are functions of tau. X uh, is an element of the, the finite um, cartan. Okay, so with that in place, the, the spiral denominator is a product uh, over the positive finite roots of these theta functions. And the theta function of tau in a variable z is um, product one minus i i z q to the n minus one minus q to the n minus q e to pi i z q to the n equals one to infinity. You see, this is pretty familiar. This is the um, in the denominator of the character for the uh, Vermeer module that appeared at the beginning of the last lecture. And it's this thing that um, in the Hamiltonian reduction is supposed to be in some sense uh, cancelled by uh, tensoring with this uh, charge-free fermion algebra. Okay, so as you can see from the notation, this is an example of a uh, classical kind of function called a theta function. Uh, numerator B lambda uh, is also, it's also a kind of theta function. Uh, roughly speaking, because it's a sum over this affine vial group, which in this case is actually because of the definition of uh, principal admissible weight, this, this group is isomorphic to the, the actual affine vial group, uh, which itself is a semi-direct product of the finite vial group uh, with a lattice, the rank equal to the rank of the finite root system. Uh, so B lambda becomes a sum over the finite vial group of a sum over a lattice of a bunch of stuff, uh, but which kind of looks like, so if you examine the geometry of um, affine root systems, you get terms looking like this, so Q to the power of n squared. Isomorphic that we have lambda is like multiple that we have is under assumption for your setup. Oh, um, it's actually it might not strictly be true in the co-principal case, right? Um, I mean, it, it's it doesn't really matter. It's um, all I mean to say is that it's a semi-direct product of finite group with a, a lattice. Um, but in fact, I mean, so for general admissible weights. Uh, the, the corresponding root systems can be quite uh, varied, right? Um, so you can be in G2 and uh, have a admissible weight whose root system is type A. Um, but uh, for uh, if, if, the, if the level is admissible, in other words, if uh, K lambda zero is admissible, then in fact, um, the corresponding root systems have to be essentially of the same type as the, the overall root system. So it's, it's a feature of the, the level being admissible as well as the weight being admissible. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, but should I imagine that the lattice is maybe a different one? So is it maybe a different lattice than the one that you would have yeah. the usual? Yeah, it's like it's a dilated oh. version of the usual lattice. Yeah. Um, okay. So. I don't want to write any actual formulas, but just morally, uh, these B lambdas are sums over the finite vial group of theta functions. And we know that theta functions are modular. So 
B lambda. So let's do a modular transformation. So some factor appears that doesn't really matter. Okay, and I'll, I'll start getting a bit more concrete about what these coefficients A are uh, in a second. Oh yeah, thanks. Yeah. So let's consider the case where F is in the, the largest uh, nilpotent orbit. Uh, it's called the principal nilpotent orbit. Uh, so just we actually saw in Daniele's talks. Um, so in this case, right, so you could ask, so for what uh, denominators is OQ equal to the principal orbit? Uh, this is for Q greater than or equal to the joule coxter number. Uh, so in some sense, this is the opposite extreme to integral case. Um, you need the denominator to be basically big. Uh, in this case, G zero is just H. So this Goldilocks condition, the, the inter, integrability part doesn't uh, say anything. Uh, everything is already integral with respect to this. So that's okay. Um, so Goldilocks means uh, non, well, anti-dominant with respect to all alpha positive roots. Okay, so it's time for me to say a bit more about um, the, the structure of the set of admissible rates in general. Okay, so recall that um, for the uh, vacuum weight, uh, we have the corresponding simple uh, root system, which is just this. It kills the denominator of K. Um, so this weight, K lambda zero in particular, is not going to be anti-dominant with respect to uh, uh, all of these weights because, uh, roots, I should say, sorry, uh, because they're in the integral root system, right? So uh, that's just an example to build intuition. Um, actually, just to begin, so, so let's say, what are the admissible weights lambda with, okay? Um, so what you need is, so I'm considering for the moment the opposite case of what's going to be of interest uh, for principal reduction. Uh, but what are the weights that have a set of simple roots the same as uh, pi q. Well, things that are integral with respect to all the finite simple roots. So lambda plus rho alpha i for i one through the, the rank is integral. Um, so it must be integral and greater than zero. So is in um, p plus, right? The, the dominant integral weights for the finite guy. And they must be regular. Well, yeah. Lambda plus rho must be MP plus, it must be regular. Um, and also you kind of you can't let the, the, the weight get too high because if it got too high, uh, then theta would start um, the, the pairing between theta and your weight would become large, but your level is fixed. So your pairing with this root would eventually become negative, which is not allowed. So it would violate this condition, but for this affine root, okay? So that gives a kind of upper limit here. Um, so that ends up depending on P. And I'll call this, this is P plus reg such that nu and theta is less than uh, P. So all of those, all of these weights um, have the same integral root system as K lambda, and none of these are any good for the reduction because they're, they're completely integrable. Um, now, in general, uh, for each alpha, let's say the, the, the finite guy, um, this kind of, you imagine, so again, uh, so let's imagine SL3 hat, for example. So for each simple root, 
um, you can ask yourself, so it's your fixed uh, an admissible weight lambda. And then for each simple finite root, you ask what's the first level in which, uh, so you consider all the kind of affine weights, affine roots uh, in that column. And you ask, which is the first level at which uh, uh, kind of lowest alpha i plus n delta such that, which is in pi of lambda, right? And so by um, the equal rank condition for each of the simple roots, there is such an n. And so there's a minimal such n in each of these cases. So for the case, so for this, this particular uh, simple root system, these n's are just zero for all of the simple roots, right? But in general, there'll be some non-trivial numbers. Um, so you can package that collection of numbers itself into a weight, right? Package this mapping alpha i to n i to a weight, which we'll call eta, which is again in P plus. Formally, what that corresponds to is taking uh, a translations, so there's some element in the affine vial group and applying that to uh, pi q. Um, so that still doesn't quite get all of the uh, admissible weights, because what could also happen is that uh, some, uh, you might need to also apply some element to the finite vial group uh, to get all the possible um, simple root systems. Um, but all the sim possible simple root systems are of this form, okay? We also remark that um, this eta, um, it also can't be too big because kind of if you, if you send this root up, well, firstly, it can't be bigger than Q because if we're bigger than Q, then another um, integral root would appear coming from below. So they're all between zero and Q. Uh, but also they can't all simultaneously be too big because if they are, then again, the pairing with uh, theta sends this root too far down. So again, there's an upper limit, uh, which in this case says that this has to be uh, of height no higher than Q. So then the lambdas with this high lambda are of the form yt minus eta nu minus rho p reg, okay? And by combining everything then, we have a kind of parameterization given by taking an element in the finite vial group, P plus P reg and P plus Q, nu eta equals Y T minus E. Okay, so it's a parameterization of um, admissible weight. Now I'm going to completely ignore um, a detail, which is that, uh, well, I'm not completely ignoring it as I'm commenting on it, um, but you have to take a certain quotient of this uh, set in order to get a bijection. So there's a, there's a finite to one, there's a finite to one map. Um, and it's not very important for what I'm going to say. Okay, so returning to this uh, principal case. So we said that the, the weights that we're going to take have to be Goldilocks. In other words, they have to be anti-dominant for all of these uh, finite weights. So that means that the corresponding uh, root system of such weights has to have all of these ends positive, right? So you lift, if you left any of these uh, weights kind of on the floor, then it, uh, you know, that would be a, a weight with, that would be a root with respect to which your weight is integrable. So you have to get all of these up off the off the floor, as it were, um, and that's yeah, that's it. Then um, you can freely apply elements in the finite vial group, and you still get valid uh, uh, root systems. So, uh, okay, Goldilocks is parameterized by WP. Rig. E plus. So that's a condition on eta, right? Um, and it's just saying that uh, eta can't pair trivially against any uh, simple root. So 
this way eta also has to be regular. So in this uh, principal case, we get a very pleasing symmetry between uh, the numerator P and the denominator Q. Okay, and this is a, like a shadow uh, or somehow certainly related to um, it's a fagan frenkel duality, which relates uh, you know, minus H check plus P over Q and minus H check plus Q over P. Um, anyway, what I want to say now, um, so you let's uh, so take some W reps of PRK Goldilocks. So we have some B lambdas. Uh, I'll call this. So at the level of um, yeah. All right. So sorry, I got slightly out of order here, but um, now that I've described the uh, parameterization of admissible weights, I can say what the coefficients a lambda lambda prime were in the modular transformation that I described earlier. They can be written in terms of, uh, so here lambda, you know, is pi w uh, nu eta and lambda prime, similar thing, prime, prime, prime. Uh, and I've omitted a bunch of factors that are not very important here, but um, basically these functions are given by these kind of R group sums. And I, hope, I mean, there's a lot of details here, but I hope it's not too surprising because I said that the B lambdas themselves are defined as sums over the Weyl group of theta functions and modular transformations of theta functions kind of look like this in general. Uh, all right, now we're going to this uh, principal case. So we're making an additional restriction on the eaters that can occur. So you take one of, take some representatives, do a modular transformation. That's the formula you get for that. Now you're gonna get a bunch of uh, lambda primes occurring, which are all W dot related to each other. So when you do the Hamiltonian reduction, those all become the same module. Uh, so you have to sum uh, these corresponding coefficients and since we're in this nice case um, where all of the integrable roots have gone off the, the, the floor, as it were, then any element of the finite Val group acts uh, sending an admissible weight of this in this set to another admissible weight in the same set. So in general, what could happen is if, so if you have some uh, root uh, which is horizontal, then when you apply some Weyl group element, it goes around to the negative half, and that's no longer a subset of the set of positive roots of the affine Lie algebra. So for more general nilpotent elements, it gets more complicated, but in this case, it's okay. So... Um, one question about your formula, Jethro. Yeah. You've got W in the, like, the lambda labels and as a summation index for the sum. Um, where, where is which W used? Oh, yeah. Um, so it doesn't really, yeah, um, you. Okay, so it doesn't enter in the sum in that, in that formula? No, um, okay. so it, yeah, it, it enters in the formula, but it, in a way that doesn't really matter too much. Yeah, um, yeah for this, this W is an auxiliary variable. Oh, yeah, Hamiltonian reductions, L lambda prime, L of, so in, um, in particular, this W disappears from the, because we, we're gonna uh, sum over W. So modules are parameterized by nu and eta, and then the other modules parameterized by nu and eta prime. And the S matrix is given by a sum of a sum. We get sum of our group, minus one's the Y, minus two pi i e over q, y eta, eta prime, sum, w, w, u. So again, very pleasing uh, factorization of the S matrix into a part that depends on, uh, you know, these uh, nu's and a part that depends on these eta's and have these fractions q over p and p over q appearing in this kind of reciprocal way. Okay, so this was um, worked out by, uh, yeah, there's a lot of references I've been neglecting to mention. 
throughout the lectures. So this was worked out by uh, Frankel, Katz, and Wakimoto. So now our result is more general, so we can uh, do this for other nilpotent elements as well. So, so let's take another example. So if we go to the second largest uh, nilpotent orbit, so for example, let's say, uh, yeah, well, G0 is H plus one positive root space and the corresponding negative root space. So you could say, for example, uh, type D or E, this guy is the trivalent node. Um, so now Goldilocks means, um, So it has to be integrable with respect to this weight. So that means that eta with that weight is zero. Okay. And has to be greater than zero for all the other uh, roots, right? So that's where we get this, this picture of um, eta has to lie oh, <coughs> kind of on one of these walls of this uh, chamber, right? So this is the P plus Q. And since guys in the interior are called regular, it makes sense to me at least to call this subregular. It's kind of a play on words between uh, subregular and nilpotent orbit. Um, so now the problem is um, so if we look at the character of um, the complex associated to L lambda, so this is given by. E lambda tau x over, oh yeah, I completely forgot to mention this, but the, remember that um, in the principal case, we're to tensor with the free fermions and that involved multiplying by the Val denominator. So it basically canceled the Val denominator. This is why the characters became these uh, B lambdas. So in this case, G plus is one root smaller than it was before. So one of these theta functions survives. Now, if lambda is uh, integrable with respect to alpha star, then this function has a zero on the hyperplane perpendicular to alpha star, and so does this function. Alpha star, star x. Oh, can I have like two minutes, maybe, in shop? Okay. Um, Yes, yeah, so the numerator and denominator have zeros on the same hyperplane, so it's uh, is regular, um, the quotient. Now, the thing is, if you do a modular transformation, uh, you get back a sum over all the lambdas, um, well, all the uh, replete lambdas, and some of the, they'll all be, each of those will be integrable with respect to some root, but it won't necessarily be the same root. So, uh, B lambda, one over tau, it's going to be a sum over lambda prime, repeat. You kind of, you know that because you're doing a modular transformation of a regular function, you're going to get another regular function. So you know that there must be a lot of cancellation happening uh, in the sum. The only problem is it's very difficult to work out what's canceling what. So the approach we did was to uh, take a limit uh, with x being t times call it psi, so psi outside this uh, hyperplane. Um, I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, um, by taking this limit uh, fairly carefully, um, the problematic term here and the problematic term here kind of can be analyzed using L'Hopital's rule and you end up with uh, this uh, psi star y psi star psi um, 
which are the new funny S matrices that I promised at the beginning of the, the course. And uh, yeah, I thought, so we, we get some interesting S matrices, uh, some of which um, we've asked people like Eric Roll, for example, um, to, you know, they can identify them in terms of quantum groups and some of them are um, coming from some funny quantum groups. Some of the cases in particular in type E8, um, still not clear what these S matrices are S matrices of. So kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, and I've already gone over time, so sorry. I think the last question. So, um, well, this problem with uh, with with zeros and having to cancel them. Yes, I mean, we have the same problem with the theta functions um, with the with the actual characters where you have the b divided by the val denominator because the val denominator has heaps of zeros. Yeah, and uh, in the Alpine case, these are not cancelled, so. Uh, are you, uh, I mean, I assume that you're sort of sidestepping this by saying that when you take your sums of characters or the Poincaré, then you know that your functions have to be regular because you have a rational view away. Uh, Is that a fair statement or? I mean, the S transformations upstairs and for the affine algebra, mm -hmm. they don't actually work because the convergence regions aren't. Uh, you have to analytically continue your theta functions before you can say that yeah. this is correct. So, um, sorry, this is a very technical question, and nobody else will be interested. But uh, I know that uh, <laughs> nobody else important will be interested. <laughs> but uh, in, in what sense do the modular transformations upstairs not work? I mean, they well, the the Valinda formula doesn't work. Oh, okay, uh, right, right. So the the Valinda formula doesn't apply to the affine algebra right it doesn't apply because the convergence regions are perspective by the s transform you have to oh, maybe we talk about it over t uh... um i mean right i, I guess I would, probably this is what you just said um that i mean you you have some well-defined characters for w algebra and you have an expression for them in terms of mm. these these guys upstairs um which have some modular invariance properties um with yeah the, i mean the yeah not making any claim that they give fusion rules of, of anything in particular yes. but they're explicit formulas for mm -hmm. the w algebra characters in terms of some things that you know how to compute modular transformations yeah, yeah. but uh, i mean you're right it's, it's very delicate um i mean there's like as we discussed right the, this um in order to get linear independence of the characters of the W algebra, you have to include, um, you have to take not just graded dimensions, but graded traces um, of elements in the vertex algebra. Um, uh, so you need, yeah. Um, at the same time, in order to connect with the affine algebra, you need to be able to insert these uh, kind of Jacobi variables, this, this variable X here. Um, except that these don't really exist as elements in the W algebra. So you kind of have to, well, if you do the spectral sequence in two steps, you can kind of go halfway with the X's, then let the elements in the W algebra take over and then go the rest of the way with them. But yeah, it's pretty delicate. Mm -hmm. So um, just just maybe randomly. So so sometimes you have this effect when you when you have a, uh, a sub sub root system, and you start restricting. So you look at the restricted root systems, and usually that's a usual root system, right? But in in some weird cases, this does not happen, right? Because sort of because applying the val group changes you from some parabolic to some other parabolic, which has a different restricted root system. Is uh -huh. that something that appears? When, when, because um, that's not frequently appears bad in E seven and E eight and so on. Uh, I'm not sure you mean exactly like what what's. I mean, what, what's bad about turning one parabolic into another parabolic? I mean, this this happens here, right? Uh, yeah, the Val group changes the root subsystem with respect to which the admissible weight is integrable. Um, maybe, I mean, some something very awkward that happens is, um, maybe this is related to what you're saying. Uh, like, when you're outside this principal case, and you take a, an admissible weight 
and you apply, uh, do a, a dot action of some elements in a finite value group, the result might not be uh, uh, an admissible weight. Right? So um, basically because the, if you had some horizontal, uh, uh, some finite roots in your um, integral root system, they could be sent to the negative half. And so they're no longer positive roots for the affine guy. So in the principal case, uh, it's, it's very nice because if everything comes up off the, off the ground as it were, and then any uh, finite valid group just sends the positive roots into themselves. But in general, you have this very complicated interplay between um, like how small a denominator you want to take and which kind of subset of the finite valid group you're allowed to apply. So, yeah, awkward things like that do happen. Yeah. All right, let's take Jethro for a second.